Um, good morning. As Chris said, I'm, I'm Dan Crichton. Just a, a initial question. How many people are kind of part of committers now, right now on ODT in this room? We've got a few, uh, about five, six. And some of you guys might be wondering what ODT actually means. Um, I'll get to it. I, I work for the government, so often we make really terrible acronyms uh, for things. Um, so it was, this, is, this is the case in point where it's something that never got lost, uh, should have probably gotten lost. But uh, it, it picked up traction and has been with us ever since. Um, a little bit uh, in terms of what we're going to talk about today, uh, I thought, you know, given that this is a science track, um, I thought that people might be interested in, in understanding some of our um, uh, challenges that we have in space data uh, management and working with space systems at JPL. Um, I was going to spend some time talking about uh, kind of our movement towards big data, um, kind of what, what has been happening in science that's really uh, uh, driving us towards thinking more and more about big data. Um, that really has led to the history of, of ODT and why ODT was created to begin with. Uh, we were really looking at and thinking about, you know, how do we begin to address big data management and, and what are some of the challenges. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk about some of the applications. And I suspect you'll be hearing about these in the next uh, uh, two days. Uh, today, uh, throughout the day, I think there's several talks that are on different aspects of ODT. Um, and then uh, kind of start thinking about what, what about going beyond science? Um, ODT is addressing a lot of challenges in science, but we believe that there's a lot of opportunities to actually think about uh, how ODT can be used beyond just science. And part of my, my presentation style is, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys, um, if you have questions, you'll ask questions. Uh, we can certainly do it at the end, but if you have things that we're going through and you want to say, hey, can you clarify this? You know, I think it's a small enough room that I'd be happy to take questions too as we're going through. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a principal computer scientist. Uh, I joined JPL um, in 1995. Um, I spent about 25 years, uh, in the past 25 years, it seems like I'm not that old, <clears throat> but maybe I am, uh, developing software systems, uh, wearing different hats. Uh, I've gone all the way from <clears throat> being sort of an intern uh, to uh, being a software developer engineer to architecting, and now uh, I, I feel like I don't get to touch code enough. Um, but uh, that's one of the, the challenges of kind of going on in your career. Um, I actually wear two hats at JPL. I, I exist in two different organizations. <clears throat> one is overseeing how we actually build uh, planetary systems. The other is actually earth science. And uh, I'm also a, a, what we call PI, that's a principal investigator for actually working and proposing on, uh, working on systems, doing research. So I actually work with the National Cancer Institute as well. So working in planetary, working in earth, and helping cancer research actually build science-based systems. Uh, so you can see a lot of the reason why we're trying to look at how do we actually build common capabilities across all these systems. Um, I served in the last couple of years on a National Research Council committee on massive data. That's going to be coming out pretty soon. Um, and kind of my uh, reason I'm here to talk first is that um, I was the original uh, PI for ODT. Uh, most of the code is probably gone by now. It's been ripped out by everybody else. But <laughs> I get picked on sometimes. Uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, the, uh, the, the start of ODT was something that we launched in 1998 at JPL. <clears throat> um, so when you look at this picture, uh, what, what do you see? You see uh, on the upper left, which we'll talk about in a minute, you see um, our Mars Curiosity. This is uh, a rover that's sitting on the surface of Mars talking to orbiting satellites that communicate back to Earth. This is, is you know, uh, things that take 10 minutes of light time to actually get that communication back to Earth. So there are things that are, are definitely remote sensing uh, instruments that are capturing data. On the upper right, <clears throat> you see our Earth science satellites uh, that are orbiting the Earth. Uh, again, remote sensing. The thing on the bottom, which you might not realize, see if I can actually uh, show it there. There's a, actually a baby in there. It's an infant that's actually wired. And I say they're actually taking remote observations, in situ observations, if you will, of this infant for actually measuring uh, and, and understanding what it is. And so there's, there's actually quite a bit of, of connection between these. And when I've given talks on ODT, the, the, what we've really focused on is how do we actually capture all this observational data from all these experiments, you can call this an experiment, that we actually do in science. Um, just to give you a little bit of history, so, so thinking about this, why, why does JPL do this? Well, 
Um, back in the early 30s, uh, 1936, uh, Theodore von Karman, who was a professor at Caltech, began uh, rocket testing in, uh, in the Rio Seco. Um, that led to, initially, to uh, some uh, missile testing and so forth with the Army. So we were not a NASA center. Uh, NASA actually didn't start until 1959. We were actually doing Army testing, and we were working with uh, at launching of rockets. Um, what what uh, uh, our initial director of JPL really began to realize is that it wasn't the rocket that was important, it was the payload. So we switched from, uh, really in, in 1958 with the Sputnik era, from actually building rockets to actually creating the payloads that flew on the rockets. And that became a seminal change for JPL because we began to really think about how do we actually build the instruments we actually care about. That's led to planetary science, that's led to work, work with uh, with astrophysics and then to earth science as well. So we have experience in working with all these areas. The key thing is that JPL, we're a, what we call a FFRDC, we're a Federal Research Development Center, we're a division of Caltech. We are, uh, we're not, uh, I'm not a NASA employee, so we've got the ability to be a research lab and actually begin to apply what we're doing to other areas. That, if you think about it, is some of the impetus of why we did ODT. Not only to, to address our areas in physical science, but how can we actually take what we're doing and really address national priority hard, hardcore questions. <clears throat> um, this just shows the, some of the sample JPL missions that we have flying. Um, uh, it, uh, this is already outdated because I don't have the uh, Mars Curiosity on here, but you can see that we've got a, a number of different uh, uh, spacecraft that are flying. In planetary science alone, we have 110 instruments that are making observations uh, in the solar system. These are things that are actually returning physical data. So there's, there's quite a bit of a variety. And when these things major, often we build instruments that are unique, they're one of a kind, they're built at universities. And so our, some of our challenge is that you know, we can't predict in five years what kinds of, what kinds of science uh, experiments, what kinds of instruments they're actually going to be built. Um, and so part of what we need to do is have an ever evolving capability to be able to capture the data products that we call them from these instruments and be able to serve those data products. Um, so, you know, the, the latest feat, hopefully everybody saw it, you know, uh, we, uh, we're quite proud of this, but the latest feat was our Mars Curiosity, which landed uh, on March 6th at Gale Crater on, on Mars. Um, major event, uh, at, people may, may uh, have read all the news about it or watched the videos or were, were watching online like all of us to be able to, uh, to see what was going on. The major thing was this, this idea of actually lowering uh, the, uh, the Mars rover and then cutting the tether and, and then flying away. And that was a, what we call a sky crane. So kind of an amazing engineering feat. Um, and, and so this, this is an important part of JPL to be able to get things onto planets. And sometimes we even hear, between us at JPL, that, uh, that you know, once we've gotten there, we're done. Well, the answer is no. Once we've gotten there, the science begins. And that's really where groups like uh, the, the ones I'm involved and my colleagues here, here from JPL and other, other centers um, is that that's when the, the, the critical science begins and we really begin to, to take over. So when we send out a, a mission, our spacecraft mission, um, you know, one of the big, ch big challenges is actually being able to communicate back to Earth. So we've got an infrastructure uh, that exists around the, the, the world um, that has three, three major uh, receiving centers. Uh, we call them the, the NASA Deep Space Network. These are stations that are at three points so that we always have line of sight to a spacecraft, which is actually um, out, you know, out in the solar system. That's, that's, that's critical. And these things are huge 70-meter antennas that are locking on to spacecraft and able to actually receive things that are now at the, at the edges of their solar system. That's, those are our Voyager spacecraft missions. Um, just to give you some example challenges, <clears throat> um, and then I'll get, in, get now and then into the software challenges, but I think this is really fascinating. Um, when we, we, we landed the Mars Curiosity rover, we were, um, we were very, very close. We were within um, hundreds of yards of where we thought we would land. Um, that, that precision and navigation when you're, when you're traveling millions of miles is, is an amazing accomplishment. Um, so this gives us another example. Uh, this is our Spirit um, rover that we launched in, in 2004. Um, in, this is the analogy that often our director uses. When you actually land on Mars, the navigation uh, precision is amazing. Um, it's basically like being able to, to use a, uh, play golf. <clears throat> you tee off from Earth 
and we're close enough basically to, uh, to make a birdie if it's a three-par uh, hole. Um, so we're really, really pretty amazing kind of accomplishment to actually figure out where, where you're, you're uh, landing. And that is with the target that's moving, as this says, at 60,000 miles per hour. So we landed Curiosity. The calculations were how do we actually land, how do we actually find a precision way to actually land with uh, everything always moving. So, so we've landed, and this is where we really become a part of the picture. So software plays a critical role. Certainly the flight software plays a critical role in what we, when we build spacecraft and when we launch. Um, and, and so do the ground data systems. Uh, but more than that, for us in science, it's the science production and processing and science analysis that, that, really be, that we really get involved in to actually help support the community and the worldwide uh, scientists in actually being able to use and work with the data. Uh, the, the data as it comes down to Earth is, it, it, it's telemetry data, it's, um, it's a signal. We've got to take that signal, we've got to split the signal, we've got to extract out what we would call engineering data from that, we've got to extract out the science data from that, and so we've got to begin to create what we call um, pipelines that allow us to, to bring the data streams in, be able to start to separate and extract out the science data, and begin to actually build what we call science observations for use by the community. Um, and that's really the focus of what we look at, is how do we actually, once we, can, we start to get the data, how do we actually generate these higher order data products, we call them, how do we actually start to manage those data products, and how do we be able to serve those to the worldwide community? And I'll talk about, uh, in a few slides, come up some of the challenges, which is, is just the increase of data. Um, so, as I mentioned, you know, science for us, it really, I think more than ever, has become a worldwide uh, activity. Uh, in planetary science, until about 2000, the U.S. was, was, was virtually um, the, one of the only uh, nations that was actually flying any kind of spacecraft. Uh, 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 ESA, or the European Space Agency, has begun and is part of that mix. Uh, the Indians have flown Chandrayaan and are orbiting uh, the, the moon. The Chinese are launching spacecraft. Um, the Japanese are launching spacecraft. And so what uh, if we look at, look at a very, very um, you know, 1980s, 1990s model, um, we could see, a, see a, a, a very different picture than we see now, which is the fact that we've got a worldwide uh, observation system, really, of, our, of what's, what's going on in space, both for Earth, for interplanetary research, for astrophysics, and we've got a community, a worldwide scientists, that really want to be able to go, they're not concerned with where the data is coming from, they're concerned with once they get the data, how they actually do research on that. And so part of our goal is, how do we start to provide a way to do uh, distribution of data from highly distributed environments? These are environments which are where, where different groups are managing data, and you've got data that's growing at astronomical rates, and I'll, sh I'll show that in a minute. No pun intended. Uh, so um, we've got uh, systems that are very heterogeneous. Um, part of the challenge that we have in, in working is um, we've got different groups building different systems. We want to be able to access the data from those systems. Um, we've got... Um, uh, often, often a lot of the, the, uh, the, the data are built around the instruments themselves, and so we're looking at how do we actually make that data useful and usable when, it come, when it's actually developed, and how do we, over time, be able to support the instruments which might have more capability, but not force a standard stock kind of structure on that, that data. Um, one of the, the major complaints by our science community has been, is that access traditionally has been, been difficult. I think that's getting better. Um, I think there's more and more data that's being served to the community. Um, but the question now is becoming is how do we move from not only access to data, but really what we we're concerned about in terms of big data is analysis of that data. How do we actually begin to extract meaning from that data? And that's a very challenging problem when your data is distributed, when it's large and voluminous, when you want to be able to fig you know, figure out how to integrate it uh, from multiple places. <clears throat> this just shows you a picture of planetary science. Um, the interesting thing about planetary science is that uh, be, uh, we started flying missions around 19, 1960s. So between 1960 and about 2001, we captured four terabytes of data. So it tells you in about 40 years um, that we captured four, four terabytes of data. In 2001 to about 2002, we captured another four terabytes of data. <laughs> so we put a lot more capable instruments out um, in one year that began to be able to capture the entire collection we'd already captured in terms of, of the archive planetary science. Um, and we've seen that grow. And so from 2001 
to about now 2012, 13, we're at half, at half a petabyte. So we've grown from four terabytes to 500 terabytes um, in the last decade. Um, that, that growth is gonna continue on. And the data is uh, becoming uh, complex to a point that, uh, and, and, and large enough to a point that we need to think of other paradigms for how we actually give the data to our scientists. They, they, their traditional approach is they spin up, they take their computer, they spin up IDL or MATLAB or one of their uh, nice uh, their tools, and they download all that data. But we're beginning to look at ways that we need to, to start to think about that differently. Earth science. Uh, Earth science, this is just looking at what we call the level two products. These are our processed uh, products that we get ready to sort of grid to the, to the earth and things like that. These, are, um, these have grown at, at similar rates, where we are in Earth science looking at, at about four petabytes of, of data. And so you've seen just a massive increase and, and data that's going on there. Um, so, same challenge, uh, different discipline, um, and we can keep going. We can go into astronomy. It's the same challenge in astronomy. And in fact, astronomy is beginning to think about the question about, of exabytes. How do we begin to deal with the, sort of the exabyte range of missions where uh, we have data coming down, the data is so massive that we have to first do, to do sampling of the data to actually extract out what we think the good bits are. Uh, and then we've got to start to create, build archives to capture them, and then we've got to start to build services to help analyze them. It's a very, very different approach than what we have been doing in the last 30 years. So moving to this new paradigm, as I mentioned, you know, we've got highly distributed multi-organizational systems. Um, systems are moving you know, towards loosely coupled federations, and I'll show this in a, in a minute, and you're going to hear some of the, um, the, the case studies later today and tomorrow about the kinds of systems that are, uh, that we have in science where we're building federations of, of data archives that need to be able to share data. Um, sharing of not only data, but services are becoming more important uh, for discovery, access, and, and transformation. Rather than downloading a, a 10 gigabyte image, um, what we might want to be able to do is, is download a subset of that image. We might want to be able to do is transform that image. We might be, want to be able to do other kinds of capabilities. And so we're seeing cases where uh, we have, have massive amounts of data where we want to push more and more of that computation uh, out to where the data is located. And then we want to address some of the, of the challenges of what we call complex modeling and inter interdisciplinary science. Um, you know, uh, many people may think that, well, you know, we've got all this data and it, it, it's all integrated and we can just go off and we can run, run sort of interdisciplinary science and analysis. Um, the reality is that just being able to correlate um, something like, like, you know, temperature, um, which is, is, you know, we don't stick a thermometer out <laughs> out on the, around the earth. We actually measure radiances and then we, can, we calculate temperature. But, but did we derive it in the same way? What were the conditions? How, what was the calibration of the instrument? Um, there's a lot of things where, where, where starting to compare data becomes a real challenge. And so as we look at the fact that we can now bring all this data online, the question to do more and more interdisciplinary research is one that is becoming more important in science. So we're, we're changing the way in which we really think data analysis has been performed. <clears throat> so I mentioned the movement towards uh, uh, more of these research networks. Um, and this will give you an example of some of these research networks. Um, on the upper left, um, you've got the planetary data system. Um, the planetary data system, as I mentioned, is, is an archive it's now a f about 500 terabytes of data. The data is distributed across the U.S., uh, organized by scientific discipline, um, and that's the U.S. We now have Europe uh, that has what they call the Planetary Science Archive. We've got uh, the Indians, which are bringing on an archive, and the Japanese, and we're trying to integrate all this data together. And so you, you've got a distributed network that has all these properties of wanting to be uh, distributed, collaborative, information-centric, uh, growing, evolving, heterogeneous, so forth. And the, and the planetary data system, uh, when it was funded by, by NASA in the, in the 80s, um, they, they didn't provide really any architectural guidance. Um, they didn't provide them any kind of standards in terms of what they had to buy. Um, and so people just began to, to capture data. And so, uh, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes, so our, our first challenge of ODT, which was planetary science, was how do we bring together all this disparate data that was, was built with all this heterogeneous technology um, the, the, and, and provide it to the community for use. 
Another one is the Earth observation, which you can't see really well in here, but again, it's the same idea of a, of a distributed infrastructure. This is NASA's implementation. I know other agencies also have their archives as well. Um, and so you've got a distributed network of, of data repositories that exists, again, organized by scientific expertise or discipline, um, and you want to provide access to that. Um, same thing up here in climate research, and I know there's a talk that I'll be talking about how, how sort of this community of observations and this community of climate models have come, become coming together. Um, and then we're doing the same thing in, in climate, or, I'm sorry, in cancer research. So, and I'll talk about that case study because it's very interesting. When we first released ODT, uh, uh, you know, the, we were looking at the idea of software reuse. Uh, um, going in and changing your code um, and then redeploying, to me, isn't really software reuse. Uh, the software use is that we wanted to draw the line at the right level so that we could have the building blocks so that we could go into planetary, we could go into cancer research, we could cut another deployment of ODT and actually just upgrade the infrastructures in these systems. All right, <clears throat> and that is the key point. We had to identify what are the common architectural pa uh, patterns in the systems that we could exploit. Uh, we began to realize that there were common things that we were doing over and over and over in every system. Um, and, you know, while each community does have their own standards in terms of how to find their data and so forth in systems, um, we felt that there was a reference architecture underneath this that we could begin to, to find the common building blocks. Um, and so our, our approach, and I, I think I heard in the business session this morning, was that you know we we have a, a we had a lot of good solid smart developers that were developing this. We weren't looking to develop a turnkey capability. We we're looking to build libraries and building blocks in a framework that could actually be reused. And that was one of the things that we were really looking for is how could we actually bring this to bear so that we could quickly stand up a data system, whether it's generation of the data or archive of the data or distribution of the data or supporting analysis of the data that we could reuse and share across all of our our different environments. <clears throat> so let me talk now about, about ODT um, and you know, kind of the, the reason why we are, why are here this morning. Um, so ODT is an open source framework. Uh, its focus was on, is on data management. Uh, it was funded originally in 1998 and uh, the, the problem that uh, we, we posed to NASA to fund it was look at, you know, you, you have funded construction of all these disparate databases and systems, you haven't constructed, uh, haven't funded ways in which you could actually start to create interoperability. Um, at that time, um, the, the uh, planetary data system, uh, which is one, was one of our targets, distributed all of their data on CD-ROM. Uh, and they were going to DVD-ROM, DVD-ROM, and thought, well, that's, that's fine. Um, now, some of those technologies were a little bit ahead saying, wait a second, you know, I can't see how this is going to work in five years because um, the, the data volumes are going to increase so much. So they thought, well, you know, when we have a couple of terabytes of data, no big deal. Well, I was able to show that the, the, the cost of them doing data distribution in the next five years was going to far exceed our cost of actually building something like ODT to actually link it together. And that, that actually flew with NASA. Um, we also had another case of, uh, in, in, in space interferometry in the area of astrophysics, and we've gotten back in astrophysics again recently, um, to help them sort of build a, a capability so as, as they were making nightly observations, their data could be captured, we could bring the components in, we could distribute that to the, data, to the community. So our, our first goal was trying to build some components for ODT, and I'll talk about uh, the, the reference architecture there. Um, we made enough progress in understanding some of these, these problems and particularly the planetary data system challenges of trying to figure out how to get access to these distributed repositories that um, we, we began working with the National Institute of Health in 2000 um, and about 2001 did some prototypes for them. And we helped them uh, begin to look at an, an area called cancer biomarker research, which, you'll, which I'll talk about. And then I think there's a talk on it today or tomorrow. Um, other areas, earth science, I'll talk about, and then, and then medicine as well. Um, and I showed you that, that initial picture in the beginning of us saying, gee, you know, what are the differences between us being able to observe um, uh, something on Mars um, and us being able to observe an infant that's sitting in an ICU um, and being able to actually extract and make inferences? Because 
uh, what my good friend uh, at Children's Hospital tells me is that our um, is that that something like a baby, an infant, is an experiment. Most doctors don't think that way, but he thinks that way and says, you know, it's really a hypothesis that we have in terms of a diagnosis. And so, as we're capturing, we're measuring, we're, we're trying to understand. It's data that that that's important that leads to us better understanding um, disease. And so. Our whole focus is how do we actually capture those observations and make that available. Um, in 2008, we got more involved in climate research, um, and we've gotten um, now again more involved, uh, thanks to, uh, to Chris Mattman over here, uh, in 2010 in the area of radio astronomy and uh, understanding some of their just daunting big data challenges. So the, the focus for ODT has been, you know, how do we support the generation of data? And we'll talk about that. So those are, you know, we build these complex pipelines that have uh, many, many states that have to be fulfilled as we are generating data and in, 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 uh, running algorithms. So that's, that's a workflow that's um, understanding and allocating uh, uh, jobs to different computational infrastructures, um, and then the ability to, to generate, capture that data, um, and then transform and distribute to the community. Um, so we made enough progress that in 2003, NASA uh, selected ODT for runner-up for NASA Software of the Year. Um, it, uh, and in 2010, um, we got Caltech, which was which really owned the IP on it, to release the IP um, and move this into the uh, the Apache incubator program. And of course, became a, a top level project in 2011. So, to our knowledge, uh, because we've done a lot of education at NASA about the the value of of open source, um, this is the first um, project that we know of that that's come out of a NASA lab. So what was the vision for ODT? Um, the vision at the time, and it really hasn't changed, uh, but this is the, sort of the 1998, 99 vision, was we wanted to create a framework for sort of bringing, processing and bringing together all this data. The idea was that you know, the, the data was distributed, it was heterogeneous, it was, uh, we need to be able to serve it to our community, we, we want to be able to analyze it, so how do we be able to actually start to build the components that would support a construction of a distributed architecture. And so we focused on what are the discrete components that we actually needed for, for the building blocks to construct such systems. <clears throat> and like any good architects, um, we said, what are the principles that we'd like to ad adhere to? Uh, and we wrote a paper on this, and this is what actually led to us getting involved with the NIH because we presented this at a, a National Academy of Science meeting. Um, and we listed several of them. The first was that we wanted to separate the technology and the information architecture. This is probably, if I would say uh, of, of anything that, that ODT did, um, I think this is probably one of, one of the, um, the, the best things that we did. And the reason is that we wanted to understand how we could apply different problems and, and adapt the description of our data over time. Uh, we didn't want to be able to tightly couple the definition of our data into our software. And so the idea is that, that planetary science has a model, a data model, for how it describes its data. Earth science has a different data model for how it describes its data. But functionally, they do the same thing. They do very, very similar things. I have to be careful. I'll get in trouble if they do the same thing. But, <laughs> but they, they uh, do very, very similar things. And so the idea that we can take, evolve our ontology, our model, our information architecture independent of our software uh, was, was really critical for us, and it's something that I think has served us really well. Second thing that served us well, and that was, you know, we were chasing, and I had been involved for a while in the distributed computing um, world, we were chasing what were the right frameworks for distributed computing. Uh, I had um, uh, been involved in things like CORBA and, and um, you know, Java, um, you know, uh, J2EE and all these things, and, you know, the and in fact, before that, uh, DCE, I think, was the uh, was one we, we had even used. And so the, the idea was that, that I didn't want to tightly couple our, our software component, components that we want to distribute into the messaging layer. So we abstracted that out. And it served us well because uh, we, we had used what we thought was an open source uh, Corba orb, uh, probably in 1999, 2000, 2001. And uh, it turned out that uh, Iona, uh, purchased and bought the company that was putting out the open source software that we could use, and they, they changed the licensing agreements. So they called me on the phone, they said, you know, um, we see that you downloaded it, things like that, you know, and we want to give you a quote. They gave me a quote for the software, and they wanted 
And I said, well, gee, we're kind of a research project. <clears throat> $3,000 is kind of a lot to us. Um, and so uh, we, had, we had some smart developers, and we said, gee, you know, we had separated out the messaging implementation of ODT. Why don't we just swap out Corba uh, for Java RMI, and we'll, we'll, and we'll do that. And so we took the messaging um, classes that we actually had in ODT, we, we built a new implementation of those, in, uh, see on top of RMI, um, uh, and we did that over a weekend, and we swapped out and um, redeployed to our projects, and uh, we said goodbye to, 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 to the, that messaging infrastructure. So um, that was one of the things that, that, we, that was really, I think, an important about the, the reference implementation of ODT. Other things, um, as we worked with projects, one of the, in, in fact, uh, we went through several reviews where people said, gee, you know, you guys are trying to take planetary science, which is a bunch of disjoint repositories, and bring it into an integrated system. Um, you know, we don't have the funding to go off and, and, and rebuild every single center. Um, we, we, you know, we already have things that work. The same happened with NIH. We already collect our data. We just want to share it. So part of what we wanted to do was be able to encapsulate hide the differences, um, be able to wrap those, and then integrate them with a, a way to, to link the data together. And that became a really important selling point for ODT. Um, another is that we, we also felt that things like data system location dependence was important. Um, our, you know, our users, um, even, even those that are developing a sort of application or client level software, really don't need to know where, where the data exists. They just want to be able to access that data, um, retrieve it, and um, and be able to use it. And so the idea was that, A, we want to be able to have a messaging layer that would connect these together. We want to be able to, to wrap the systems. And, we, and B, we didn't care where these things were really, or C, we didn't care where these things were really running. So that became a real important principle for us. Um, and, and as we went on, we had more and more principles that really helped us be able to uh, describe our systems, um, scale what we were trying to put out and deploy, and, real, and really be able to support the separation, if you will, of the, 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 the technology layers itself and, the, uh, and the, the, the information architecture. The last, um, and, and this kind of links us now to, to here we are in 2013, was that we really wanted to leverage open source, and we really, we, and our intention from the very beginning was to be able to, to distribute ODT as open source. So, Let me talk a little bit about the implementation of ODT. So uh, back in, when we started ODT, it was uh, focused on building these set of server components, and I'll talk about those. Um, and they were built as Java components. So we wanted to be able to you know, support the Java virtual machine, be able to deploy uh, to different uh, uh, you know, operating system environments, um, and be able to plug these together. Um, some of our early deployments, it's, it, you know, as you begin to look at distributed systems, I'm always amazed at, at how heterogeneous they are. Um, you know, within the planetary community, we've got you know, Windows, we have different, you know, now kind of going away, but we had different versions of Solaris, Linux, um, Mac OS X, and so you, you, need, you have this, uh, this environment where you've got highly, highly heterogeneous sets of, of um, implementations, and so we need to be able to run on those, um, and, and so Java seemed like a, a really good deployment for us. Um, we want to provide messaging as a plugin, as I mentioned, and so um, you know we've we've gone through the whole sort of, of different different generations of distributed uh, middleware um, from Corba to Java RMI. Uh, now uh, everything is effectively REST based, um, and those upgrades I think we I just see continuing to evolve to stay current with uh, the the messaging technology. And so part of the ODT principle is. You know, if, if things already exist, we're just going to we're just going to sit on top of them and use them. And I'll talk that that you know where we, we plug in and use Hadoop, we plug in and use Solar. And you'll hear a lot about that this uh, I think the next few days. Um, and then we want to provide client APIs for being able to a to access the services. Um, and so over time, those have really really grown. And you you may see things like Java C++, and then all the way over here things like IDL, because uh, you know for us that's a science toolkit. Or scientists use it, and they want, they might want to be able to get to their science data, and so IDL becomes a really nice platform for them to actually program in. Um, I purposely left off out Fortran, by the way, um, but we, do, we we still have a lot of Fortran developers at JPL, so um, and and in the science community in general. So uh, we uh, we want to support installation of a variety of platforms. 
One of my, my initial thinking on both our deployments of planetary and cancer research was I sort of expected we would put this out there um, and you know, we would do, build these services and then and they would go run with them. Uh, the biggest challenge I think we ran into is that a lot, of the, a lot of the efforts required probably more higher end software development expertise than a lot of the centers we work with actually had. And so that was one of the things that we've had to overcome. And so building things like better installers and so forth became really critical for us. And then as we looked at, worked on our sort of the data architecture side of, of things in OUT, um, we adopted a lot of, of various standards um, in terms of how we describe metadata, in terms of how we, what metadata we use, in terms of how we build data dictionaries and so forth, which, uh, which has helped keep us in sync with that community. So um, what are the things that we think about in terms of our data life cycle? And, and you could probably think about these things in terms of data life cycles for many different areas other than science. But um, what we see uh, very clearly is for us, uh, you know, ingestion of data. So as data is coming, coming in, in from, say, a, a ground station for us, um, we're going through the steps of, of initially transforming and validating that data. Um, and this is an important step. A, you know, does the metadata, is metadata consistent? Does it meet our standards? If we get data in with poor metadata, poorly formed metadata, things like that, uh, and, it, and it goes all the way downstream, it's going to make search difficult. It's going to make usability of that data difficult because people may not understand it. Um, if, we're, if we do content validation, which we do do, um, we, we find problems. And so um, a lot of what we do in the ingestion data is running a set of rules. So here's a workflow for actually being able to validate the data as part of that ingestion process. Um, and then you know, we, we begin to, to sort of, of capture that initial set of data. Uh, and we, what we do to scale is we separate sort of the catalog, so this is why our metadata becomes so important, from the physical storage of the data. Um, and over time, we began to ask ourselves is, is do we really even care where the physical storage of the data is in regards to the catalog? There's no reason why we have to centralize those. We can catalog one place and we can describe data which is distributed in other places. So now we've got data on the cloud, now, now we've got data at other, other centers. Um, but we can catalog what exists and be able to, to provide descriptions of how to get to that data uh, through common protocols. Um, data processing. So part of once we've ingested and cataloged our data, part of what we begin to look, look at is um, you know, what, what's the data that, that you know, how do we actually process that data? How do we actually fire off these workflows? And so um, you know, we, we, can, we can end up writing uh, you know, 100 tasks that we'll, we'll fire off um, as jobs as part of a workflow that are all relayed for how we actually handle the data that are coming in. These things have dependencies. These things um, uh, need to be uh, run in certain orders. Uh, these things might, might consume computational resources. Um, so we then need to look at how, where do we run, execute those things. And so um, really, this becomes really one of the heart and souls of what ODT is now doing. And then the, it's the long-term management of the data itself. Um, as I mentioned, it's often distributed. Um, the other side of the equation is once we've got data that's processed, captured, we want to be able to distribute that. It's really the discovery of the data, um, and for us, it might be multiple repositories. Uh, it's the access to the data and the transformation. And so our goal when we set up to build ODT was, was trying to look at the end-to-end -end ecosystem, if you will, of capabilities that support this life cycle. So this shows kind of our philosophy of ODT as well. So um, we exist uh, right in the middle. So, so for us, a mission or a project may come along, a science experiment, that's going to build a bunch of things, and you know, they, they end up using ODT. Well, our goal is to end up using things that are underneath it as well and, and build out the stack in every one of these. Uh, hopefully, as we identify good capabilities up here in the missions, they, they will gravitate to, down here and be, become part, more, more and more part of the ODT suite of things, and we've done that where, where we've seen missions that have um, added value. But the idea is that this is a continuing, evolving uh, capability. And as I mentioned, um, you know, we've got a lot, a, a lot of common technologies that we're currently using. Um, you know, certainly we use Apache Tomcat um, and the web services, uh, but we're using Tika for data extraction, and we're using you know, Hadoop for a lot of computation. Um, and so these have become core parts of what we're doing. So these are the OTT components that, are, that we have. Um, if you hear a lot of discussion you can hear about now, more and more is now our catalog and archive services. Um, and this is where we are running our data management, doing our workflow, um, being able to manage files, being able to be able to, to build catalogs. Um, and so it provides a, quite a bit of services for how to, to support 
that whole framework of how we build a system. In addition, we've got other services which provide access to, to existing repositories. We call our grid services. We're being able to actually be able to understand what resources exist, access the data, transform that data, and be able to link it in. Um, separating from that, as I mentioned before, is our, our core data models, which are things that we use to describe uh, the resources, and then the actual domain science projects as well itself. So uh, in earth or planetary science, many of our, our science uh, or cancer research, many of our disciplines already have existing models, and so the idea was to, is to layer those on top of ODT. Uh, this is just showing our, our, uh, our, our catalog and archive service data model. It's very simple. Um, the idea is you got a product, and that product is then defined by a product type, um, and it's really a keyword value kind of store that we're using to construct and describe our science data. Um, this is just showing now the, the idea of, of turning something like our catalog and archive service in ODT into a pipeline. And so what you begin to see over the, here on the, on the far left is you begin to see the spacecraft files, other kinds of files, jumping files coming in. Um, uh, that's coming into our, our information management framework uh, that's sitting on top of ODT. That's doing all the validation, as I mentioned. It's doing the um, processing. It's doing the, in, in fact, those are the processors. Uh, and it's doing the, then the data distribution through some sort of user interface. And so, the, the, so when we've gone through now, um, we can stand up uh, a, 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 a skinny data system in a couple weeks, which it might have taken us um, a, a year or more before to do that. Um, this is probably a little hard to read in the room, but this is just showing an extension of some of the key things. And so you've got product delivery going on, services there that are dealing with that. You've got file management. This is a big part of what we do in ODT, which is a lot of our, our data that comes in are file-based data, but we've got to be able to describe that, extract data from that. Um, and, and that's linked all uh, directly to our workflow management, uh, management of the resources that we have. So if we're going to allocate, say, external um, clusters, things like that, we can go off and run those, and we can run what we call a, a programmable uh, um, algorithm that would run on one of those clusters. Um, this is just showing the query models in ODT. So we've got some stock query models in addition to the domain model, which we use to describe um, in, in, uh, the, the data itself that we actually have for, as resources. Um, and so we use a number of standards, uh, most prominently something called ISO 11179, which is a standard for how you actually describe dictionaries of data. Um, and we can use that for actually describing the, the elements and linking to the, the, the data that actually exists in a distributed system. Um, this is showing now the other pattern uh, in addition to uh, archiving the data, this is access now to data that's been archived. Um, and so this is what we ended up using in planetary science to actually link all our repositories together. We put out uh, product services at all the various repositories and profile services, which lets A, discover what existed, and B, be able to retrieve the, those files. And then we began to write services that said, hey, I'd like to get my file not, say, in a, a PDS image format, but I want to get back in a JPEG or a GIF format. And so uh, a lot of transformations began to take shape. So now moving on to talk about some of our applications. Um, and as I mentioned, the NASA Planetary Data System was the first one we worked with in ODT. Um, and so uh, PDS has got eight nodes distributed across the US, as well as international connections. Uh, it's, it's 500 terabytes of data. And up until about 2001, uh, when we, we got a mission that was going to double the size of the archive, as I mentioned, they were distributed on, on optical media. Um, the, the, uh, what we did in, two, in 2001 is went to, went to them and said, look, we've been building this framework. Why don't we begin to actually deploy this operationally? And we were able to actually do that in 2002 for the Mars Odyssey mission and change the paradigm because the uh, science community at, up to that point uh, had no uh, uh, experience in actually getting data uh, online. The nice thing about this implementation, too, is that uh, we didn't change any of the software that exists at any of the sites. We were able to wrap it, integrate it, and distribute the repositories. So Earth science uh, came along after planetary science, as I mentioned. Uh, and uh, we used ODT early for a mission called QuickSat SeaWinds. Uh, quick, quick scat, sorry, and sea winds. There were actually two missions, but they were, it was an integrated project. Um, and we were able to actually take and, and remove a lot of the sort of proprietary COTS-based software. At that point, they were, they were pretty uh, um, uh, connected to using Sybase and Sybase services. We swapped all those out, and we began to use ODT for that. And uh, 
started to write all these workflows. <coughs> and, and as I showed you that framework, the idea is it was really our first instantiation where we could show a mission that was actually using ODT to uh, begin to wrap and execute their algorithms. Um, at that point, all that stuff was centralized, and it's evolved now for, for future missions. Uh, uh, OCO, our Orbiting Carbon Observatory, was our first mission that really began to look at this <coughs> saying, okay, we've done this great architecture, how do we scale it now? And so how do we push out the computation? How do we push out the, the, the file and resource management so that we could be able to scale it as the size of our jobs, our computation increased, and as things like cloud services became available, we could begin to scale it to there as well. Uh, airborne. So. Uh, JPL came along and said, gee, you guys have done this now for satellite missions, 2011. We've got a, we've got a big challenge in airborne missions, and that is that you know, we fly these airborne missions. These are aircraft that fly over, and they take sort of, some sort of regional localized measurements. Uh, the, the data uh, often is not going into any kind of instrumented data system that people can get access to. Um, if, if, if there is data processing going on, it's generally been done by PI, a local layer machine, things like that. And so we took the instantiation of ODT and what we have our experience of doing the earth science and pretty quickly stood up a capability for airborne missions um, and we applied it to something called the CARB mission in this last uh, couple of years which is, is making carbon observatories uh, measurements. Um, and we're, a, we're able to show a substantial savings back to, to, uh, to JPL NASA for that. Um, the other thing that we did there is um, historically, JPL has procured its own computational infrastructures, and instead we convinced them to go out to Amazon and compute on top of, of um, Amazon services and, and run our, our, our PGEs there, our algorithms there, um, as part of, of ODT. And, uh, and that's worked well, too, and we could show a substantial cost savings of us not having to buy our own hardware and provision that. Um, so. Another area we got involved in is climate research, and the question there has been, gee, we're capturing all this satellite observations data. The climate community has all these forecast models. How do they actually fit together? Are the forecast models valid uh, as, as forecast models against the observations, or are they only calibrated against each other? So if you go back and look at, at what's called the International Panel on Climate Change, they run these regular uh, uh, protocols for studying climate, climate models and using the climate model output for actually doing their research. Um, historically, they have calibrated models against models. Um, what we have done in the last couple of years is actually be able to bring in the, the satellite observations and compare those against the models themselves. And we're, we're hoping that uh, that will be a, a new direction to validate not only flying these, these missions, but actually checking the models themselves for accuracy. <clears throat> Um, so one group that we ended up working with, and thanks to Lucas and Queenie who's out here uh, and, and came to JPL after we started this experiment, so I think it was working, <laughs> um, is that the, the whole Earth System Grid Federation uh, is sharing models internationally, but they had no access to the observational data. And so what we were able to do is bring in the observational data, bring in the technologies from NASA to work with them, and integrate the technologies that's, that have been built as part of the Earth System Grid framework, which is an open source framework, with what we've been doing with, uh, with ODT and sharing satellite data. And so this is that picture, which is starting to show all the satellite data going through a data exchange infrastructure running ODT called the Climate Data Exchange, and then sharing that with the, uh, the rest of the community. Um, another, another example is what we've been doing in, in, uh, with Lunar, um, and that was that uh, there was a big push for NASA to go back to the moon. Uh, and so um, they have, um, uh, they, they developed some capabilities to grab all that lunar data and make that available and provide some imaging capabilities online. Uh, that ran the cloud, that used ODT, that ran Hadoop to, to do all its tiling. Um, and so we brought that infrastructure together to be able to actually do um, sort of on the fly scalable um, image analysis of, of, of landing sites and, and um, path uh, planning and so forth for, uh, for lunar missions. Another one is radio astronomy, as I mentioned. The challenge here is that, that with the square kilometer array, they're really moving to an exabyte scale um, to capture data. Uh, we're talking about um, terabytes a second um, kinds of measurements with, with um, large, large arrays of radio uh, antennas deployed in, in areas like, like Africa that will be able to actually to grab, capture all this data. It is a 10-year problem that we right now don't know how to solve, but it's a very interesting one. 
Um, and then what I mentioned with biomedical research, um, so we're involved, uh, we're, we're supporting a network of 40 centers that are actually doing cancer biomarker research and doing things like proteomics, genomics, and other kinds of analysis. Um, and so we provide ODT to support the capture of that data. They've got um, about 40 or 50, 50 data sets now captured in ODT. We link it all together. This is the picture of that down below where they actually have a national infrastructure. And one of the things we did in addition to capturing the data is we put ODT out at all the centers, about 15 centers in this case, to share a lot of their data called biospecimen data. Um, so not only is there data, data centralized that we're capturing, but there's data that exists in distributed sense as well that we're bringing together into an integrated virtual system. Um, and then, as I mentioned, medicine. So we've been working with Children's Hospital Los Angeles for about uh, 10 years. Um, and uh, in uh, 2009, we actually won a, uh, a challenge grant from the National Library of Medicine uh, and we were actually able to bring an ODT uh, directly in there and help them start to capture their data, extract the data from medical records, and start to build a repository uh, to actually do science analysis of. Um, and so the idea was to build the data, data infrastructure as well as, in this case, bring in then the, the analytical and computational tools which you see down there below. Um, and so we built a pipeline up here to take, go, go through a series of steps where we clean the data, we improve the data, we de-identify the data, um, and then we start to build repositories and discrete data sets um, that could be shared with the community. So um, thinking about this now, uh, ODT and beyond, uh, beyond science, a lot of the things I think that we see um, in science are patterns that, that exist otherwhere and other places outside of science. Um, some of the common challenges, how do you capture massive data repositories for analysis? These are challenges that we are really uh, uh, interested in working on. How do you develop methods for processing that data? How do you run workflows on these? Um, how do you analyze the data from highly distributed rep data repositories? We're involved in a lot of efforts that are really now focusing on that question of how do we actually do data science um, and how do we do it in a, a, uh, on data that's highly distributed, um, that's highly heterogeneous, um, and, and what are the effective architectures and ways to do that? Um, then how do you tie all this data together so that you can drive integrated data analysis? So these are the challenges, some of the things that we think uh, are being addressed in science that we also see can really be addressed, I think, in other areas as well. How can you take something like ODT and use it to link data together? Um, so my encouragement to you guys is, you know, get involved in ODT, um, you know, join the mailing lists, um, the, uh, you know, create suggestions. If you have use cases, send them to the mailing list. It would be great to see what those are. Um, and to be able to talk through those and look at how ODT can be applied to other areas as well because our, I think our vision uh, as part of the o ODT community is to look at how do we really begin to make this a useful data management capability for big data management. So with that, we see ODT as a linking source and I'll take questions. I can see her. <laughs> She's on that side of being in big trouble. <laughs> so th this morning we heard a panel about the use of open source software in business. And uh, here you have described ODT as an observational system. So I'm trying to link the, the business uses of open source software. Uh, I know they're interested in big data. I know they have tremendous amounts of diverse data, so how do I link this notion of an observational system into the business world so I can relate ODT to it? So our, the domain models that we use in science are, those ones are optimized for observational data. Uh, if there's a domain model for another area, um, we're already working in defense and things like that which are not observational, um, uh, we, we, we believe we can support that by being able to effect, if we can effectively describe the data itself. Um, and I think that's the, the key, key goal is to be able to do that. But many, we think many of the patterns of being able to process the data, integrate some of the technologies that, that exist uh, for, for doing computation and provide a framework for that, that whole um, sort of uh, workflow of being able to capture the data. That's something that we think is, is really applicable to other business areas. I think the key is starting to find models or data, data definitions for data that is in other areas other than science and linking that into ODT. And that's, I think, something we are, we are seeing starting to happen. Maybe one more question. Yeah. 
So it's actually more like an observation than a question, but uh, one thing that we haven't really done, or thinking about ODT and big data, um, we probably want to take each single OT component and actually try to see how it scales to big data. So just start benchmarking, for example, how many requests to file manager we can actually send per second, how many workloads we can actually run, you know, stuff like that. So that might be something that we can actually, you know, do in the next. It would be, be a good instrument. Some of this that's stuff. That's right. Um, yeah. That's right. And we, we do we have done some some benchmarking studies because we get concerned about the size of, of volume of missions, um, but. Um, you know, the, uh, we often back into figuring out how to solve yeah. the problem rather yeah, than... Yeah, systematically, yeah. really, for each yeah. component.